Founded by a man who never had any intention of being a musician, the story of Korg is one of happenstance, serendipity, entrepreneurship, imagination, and outright genius. In the highly competitive and ever-changing world of music technology, few companies have been able to remain relevant or even in business for extended periods of time. But a testament to Korg's ingenuity is that they show no sign of relenting 60 years after their formation. Whether you're a professional, a hobbyist, or simply a fan of music, it's pretty much a guarantee that you've heard sounds coming from instruments emblazoned with those four letters that form that strange word. This is Traveller, a Korg retrospective. Tsutomu Kato was born to a merchant family in August 1926 in Nagoya, Japan. Following the Great Kanto Earthquake and the Depression of the 1920s and then the Sino-Japanese and World Wars of the 30s and 40s, this was a turbulent time to say the least. Reaching conscription age in 1944, Kato served in the Navy as part of a submarine crew. In the chaotic aftermath of World War II, the challenge of daily life was tough, but Kato's merchant background stood him in good stead. Initially trading groceries, he spotted an opportunity to make more profit with electric cables and automobile parts, which were in high demand as the country tried to rebuild. Tenacious and charming, Carto even approached the occupation army with an English dictionary and managed to persuade them to sell him cables. With society being rebuilt and laws and regulations being brought in and enforced, these trades became unviable in the late 40s, and so after moving around, Carto settled in the Shinjuku area of Tokyo. Initially working for a construction company, their development of the Kabukichu nightlife district in Shinjuku led to Kato being offered a job as a nightclub manager. He accepted. In the early 50s, the rationing system was removed, Japan returned to a sovereign state, and a period of economic growth commenced. And with that came music. By the mid-50s, Kato was managing four nightclubs and was becoming exposed to a wide range of styles. Ever with a keen sense of business, he built upon his club's reputation for live performances. And amongst the musicians who played on his stages was a young accordionist called Tadashi Osanai. Osanai had something very new, a Wurlitzer Sideman rhythm machine, and he used it on stage at the Minx, one of Kato's clubs. Osanai believed that he could improve upon the design, and after appealing to numerous sponsors, it was Kato who took him up. By 1963, they were ready and applied for the patent for a music rhythm generating machine. Setting up in a factory next to the Keio railway line, and with their initials being K and O, the name seemed to be staring them in the face. And so was founded Keio Gijutsu Ken Kyujo, with their debut product being the DA20 Donkomatic Auto Rhythm Machine, so named because of the sound it made. Don Ka, Don Ka. As luck would have it, Keo was formed at just the right time, with amplified electric instruments appearing in the hands of the pop bands of the 60s, the hit Japanese film Young General of the Electric Guitar on cinema screens, and investment being ploughed into Tokyo for the 1964 Olympics, the stage was set. Still a small operation, Keo put out a series of donkomatic auto rhythm machines before tailoring a new line specifically for a big customer, Nippon Gaki Seizo, better known as Yamaha. These new Mini Pops units were intended to accompany Yamaha's Electone organs. With 300 units required per month, Keo were going to have to up their production capabilities fast and start producing English service manuals for exported units. Ever resourceful and adaptable, Keo managed and their partnership with Yamaha was a success. Probably the best known of these units is the MP7, as it was used by a young Frenchman called Jean-Michel Jean on Oxygen Part 4, which was an international success, albeit some years after the unit was originally released. At the same time, as luck would have it, an American company called Unicord was now importing affordable Japanese guitars and amplifiers to the US, and they caught wind of a related KO rhythm product, the Rockmate. 
So began a relationship with Unicord where KO's products were badged as Univox overseas. In 1967, another young engineer called Fumio Mieda approached Kato for financial backing to produce an instrument, but this time it wasn't a rhythm machine. It was a new type of organ. Mieda already had a track record having worked for Tysco and had also designed the Univibe effects pedal that was used by Jimi Hendrix amongst others, and so Kato agreed. The first instrument he developed has since become known as Prototype 1 or First Prototype. This organ included technology for authoring timbre via electronic circuitry and had some unique features such as vowel selection, microtones and a manual high-pass low-pass filter combination dubbed the Traveller. Although not released, this was arguably the first synthesizer to be made in Japan. After further developments and changes, their first keyboard instrument saw the light of day as the Decacorg, or just Korg, the name being a portmanteau of KO and the French word for organ, Lorg. This instrument also included the Traveller filter section. Into the 70s, the company was renamed Keio Gikken Kogyo, and it wouldn't just be the name that would change in this decade. Now aware of what was going on in the West and building upon the ideas he'd developed in his prototypes, Mieda designed Keio's first production synthesizer, the Mini Korg 700. Introduced into a world of Mini Moogs and Odysseys, this was an altogether different beast. <laughs> Improving upon the design, the 700S was released the following year in 1974 and incorporated a second oscillator, ring modulator and noise generator. Japanese composer and performer Kitaro developed an affinity for it, with the 700S becoming an integral part of his signature sound. Much more affordable than US synthesizers, these mini Korgs proved successful overseas and were picked up by fledgling artists such as the Human League, who used one for the bass line in Being Boiled with the Roland System 100 on drums, and the Normals warm leatherette at the dawn of Daniel Miller's Mute Records. And so the ideas began to flow. In 1975, KO put two monosynths into one box and released the Maxi Korg, or 800 Dual Voice. They also released a dedicated bass synthesizer, the Synthabase, that would go on to be used by Dave Ball of Soft Cell and Kate Pearson of the B-52s, and two more Traveller bass monosynths followed, the 770, and the micro preset, which was a staple of the early OMD sound. <laughs> Still with an eye on guitarists, KO put out the VCF and Mr. Multipedals in the mid 70s, but perhaps most significantly, they introduced the world's first portable, battery powered electronic tuner, the WT10. This would mark the beginning of a lifelong relationship with such functional but necessary technology that continues to this very day. But back to the mid 70s, KO joined the race to create a polyphonic synthesizer, and their initial attempts resulted in the two polyphonic ensembles.
Unlike many of the string synthesizers of this era that resorted to divide down top octave oscillators and a paraphonic arrangement of a single filter and amplifier, these instruments actually have a basic oscillator filter and amp per key. This was a concept that was pushed further after Ko developed a new module, the Korg 35 filter. The significance of this was, firstly, it was a simple and compact encapsulated module containing just five transistors and six resistors, and secondly, Ko were producing it themselves and weren't relying on third-party supply. This was one of the key factors in Ko being able to produce arguably their rarest and most coveted ranges, the Polyphonic Synthesizer, or PS series. With the cunning arrangement of divided down oscillators and then filters, amps and envelopes per key, the PS3100 was a blunt force approach to polyphony. And even with their new compact filter technology, with 48 note polyphony, it was still a tad chunky. But KO went even further with the PS3300, released the same year that contained pretty much three PS3100s in one with the sounds layered together. Incredibly rare, only around 25 were made. The last of the series, the PS3200, followed a year later, and this synth differs somewhat from the other two and notably has digital patch memory. If being semi-modular polysynths wasn't unusual enough, with features like temperament adjust, resonators, KO's peculiar naming schemes, and connectors that resembled heavy machinery, these synthesizers were never going to be conventional, and to this day there really remains nothing quite like them. Just one year later, in 1978, KO would launch yet another range that would contain two foot pedals, two utility modules, a sequencer, and three synthesizers. There was a lot on offer here, one particular instrument designed by Fumio Mieda and Hiroaki Nishijima stood out and would go on to become one of their most famous synthesizers. The MS-20 was a dual oscillator monosynth with dual filters, a patch panel and some unusual features including an external signal processor with pitch to CV and an envelope follower. Pretty surprising for an affordable monosynth at the time. These combinations of features allowed for a wide range of sounds not necessarily possible on competing monosynths. There were originally two production consumer versions of the MS-20, the second of which had a revised filter design, but they can essentially sound pretty much the same. But 
perhaps most intriguing is this rare, giant blackboard version of the synth that was used to teach synthesis in classes in KO's synthesizer showroom studio that they opened that summer. The MS-20 is arguably best known as being the synthesizer used by Quentin Dupont, aka Monsieur Oiseau, on Flatbeat much later in 1999. But in fact, the list of artists who've used the MS-20 is enormous. Everything from the weird vocal processing on Goldfrapp's Lovely Head to William Orbit's Madonna Productions and way beyond. The MS-20 has become a studio staple and been brought back into production numerous times that we'll discuss a little later. And on a personal note, whilst many synths have come and gone from my studio, one thing that's always remained is my Mark I MS-20. Towards the end of the decade, Korg put out a trio of instruments that took their names from the Greek alphabet. The Delta and Lambda were preset polyphonic instruments, and good ones too, but the weirdo of the bunch was the Sigma. Intended as a special release, these synthesizers have little plaques denoting the serial numbers, but unfortunately these special instruments weren't seen as so special by the buying public, even after endorsements from a couple of big names. Most likely because attention was moving to polysynths and so this unique and capable monosynth drifted into obscurity. Through that KO made right at the end of the 70s were their electronic clone wheel organs. The CX3 and subsequent BX3 were convincing enough at creating the classic Hammond through a Leslie sound that they found their way into the rigs of Marillion, Manfred Mann and Dream Theatre. <laughs> KO's KR55 rhythm machine from 1979 is also worth a mention because it was used as the backing beat for Joe Jackson's 1982 hit Stepping Out, showing they hadn't forgotten their roots with such technology. And so to the 80s. Now whilst string machines are more commonly associated with the 70s, the pinnacle of these instruments actually crossed over into the very early 80s where manufacturers were packing lots of different sounds into these keyboards. There was the glorious Arp Quadra, the Roland RS505, the Yamaha SK50D and others, and Korg added a masterpiece to this late collection. The Trident was so named as it contained three main sections, strings, synthesizer and brass. However, in typical KO style, the Trident is atypical. Rather than the common arrangement of top octave divided down oscillators and total porophony, the Trident contains an eight voice dual oscillator polysynth the oscillators of which are then reused for the brass, which is paraphonic, and then used again for the string section, which isn't paraphonic. Combined with the classic string ensemble, a bonus flanger and individual outputs, the Trident is pure class, 
but it was a bit behind the times with profits, obies and jupiters beside it in music stores, so it sold relatively poorly and has only really gained a good reputation decades later. Significantly though, it was the first of their instruments to include some third-party solid-state music, or SSM chips, in place of their own designs. One other wacky idea in 1980 was a little guitar synthesizer called the X911. This kind of pitch to CV technology was something several manufacturers explored, and whilst it seemed a good idea on paper, effects pedals ultimately turned out to be the popular solution that guitarists were looking for. KO produced their first electronic piano, the LP10 at this time, and this instrument introduced a new feature that we all now take for granted. Key transpose. Now everything's in C. Sorted. In 1981 came a pair of synths that marked a change of direction for Keo. The Poly 6 was an affordable six-voice poly synth including SSM chips that would prove popular and provoke Roland to create a competing product the following year. The second of the duo, the Monopoly, was another slightly peculiar concept as it could operate as a four oscillator monosynth or produce four note polyphony. As it was a relatively cheap instrument, this meant it was accessible and got into the hands of many musicians and is among KO's enduring creations with modern software versions and clones highlighting this. Nineteen eighty two was a year for sequels with the Trident Mark II and the KR fifty five B, but also a successor to the Poly six, the Poly sixty one, which moved over to a sliderless panel as was to become the fashion. And so to the point in history that affected every synth manufacturer on the planet, 1983. Two huge things happened that I'm sure you're all familiar with, MIDI and the Yamaha DX7. Regarding the first of these, KO would market new MIDI solutions with their range of synthesizers, drum machines and sequencers, here demonstrated by a promo video from the time. They would also branch out and experiment with a modular effects system, the PME40X, which had 14 different modules to choose from. On 
On the second point, the DX7, KO's approach was to introduce some new digital concepts, but also to focus on affordable synths that could perhaps tempt buyers away from the delights of FM synthesis. The Poly 800 was a paraphonic setup with up to eight notes sharing one filter and amp, but it brought with it six stage digital envelopes that were a feature of a number of subsequent products. Most significantly, this programmable polysynth was comfortably under $1,000, a big moment given that polysynths had cost as much as a nice car only a few years earlier. But this low price didn't stop some big names like Nick Rhodes from using one in his rig. Keo's DW synthesizers dispensed with analog oscillators in place of digital samples of waves created using additive synthesis. This allowed for the kind of complex bell tones and bright basses that were coming from the DX7, but they ran through a familiar signal path of filter and amp with envelopes and LFO. The beefed up DW8000 was the first polysynth to include a built-in digital delay. In 1986, KO changed their name to match that which had been on their instruments since the 1970s, Korg Incorporated. They were also prolific at this time exploring sequences, drum machines, effects units and new digital synthesizers in a collection of instruments that all seemed to contain the letter D. Why? Because D for digital, baby. There was the SQD1. There was the DDD one. There was the DSS one. There was the DSM one. There was the SDD two thousand. There was also a nifty digital vocoder called the DVP-1. In 1987, Korg would release a box called the Super Section, and in the original print ad, Martin Russian is quoted as saying, someone's going to have a hit with one of these. Perhaps that should have been someone's going to get hit with one of these, but anyway, amongst the dozens of products from this time were two that included FM technology from Yamaha, the DS8 and the 707 Performing Synthesizer. <laughs> Now, as mentioned earlier, Korg's relationship with Yamaha went back to the 70s, and in fact, in 1987, they bought the controlling stake because Korg was struggling financially in the wake of the DX7, although the brands continued to make their own products. Being propped up by Yamaha, Korg were able to develop the instrument that would put them back at the top, the M1. <laughs> Thank you. 
Recognize the sound? Of course you do. It's one of those synths where you can play the game, spot the preset. Piano 16. Right on Time by Black Box. Organ 2. Show Me Love by Robin S. Ooh ah. I'm going slightly mad by Queen. You get the idea. In fact, the initial patch on the M1 universe very effectively captured how far things had moved on from the sounds of analog synthesizers that were in production only a few years prior. This multi-tambral 16-voice instrument brought together digital synthesis, sequencing and effects in a sleek package and turned out to be exactly what musicians were looking for at the time and it reportedly shifted a quarter of a million units. If this wasn't enough, the M1 is widely credited as the beginning of the workstation, a kind of all-in-one unit, something that still has a market over 30 years later. If you've struck gold, you might as well make the most of it. And unsurprisingly, Korg put out a series of related products in the late 80s and into the 90s. But a twist of fate would see another successful instrument just two years after the M1. Sequential circuits had gone out of business in 1987 and had been acquired by Yamaha. This didn't work out and so Dave Smith joined Korg, bringing with him Sequential's ideas such as Chris Meyer's earlier vector synthesis, first seen in the Prophet VS. This was incorporated along with brand new wave sequencing in an altogether new instrument. Whilst the wave station was popular with musicians, it wasn't easy to program and also suffered from some bugs. As a result, it was another synth that was more commonly used for its presets and thankfully they sounded rather wonderful. Probably the most famous use of the wave station was not in a song, but instead inside offices and homes around the world. Apple's sound designer Jim Reeks used it to create that chord, which must have been heard millions and millions of times around the globe. In the early 90s, Korg experimented with the wave drum, an instrument that would spawn many sequels. They would also develop a string of famous synthesizers, which helped Kato buy back the control of his company from Yamaha, and also the majority stake in Rose Morris that brought with it the Vox brand in 1992. Firstly, the Prophecy, was a very early digital physical modeling synthesizer that proved to hit with legions of dance acts in the West. One such act, The Prodigy, you may have heard of them, snuck a couple of the factory presets into some of their hits at the time.
With processing power being stretched to achieve the prophecy, it had to be monophonic, but a couple of years later, it was succeeded by the polyphonic Z1, which should have been an even bigger success, but it surprisingly wasn't. In 1995, a new workstation succeeded the M1. The Trinity proved very popular and reaffirmed Korg's belief in the all-in-one concept. Four versions of it were subsequently released and it found a place in pop production via the music of Will Smith, Christina Aguilera, the Backstreet Boys and many others, but also in the hands of prog rockers like Dream Theater, Yes and Keith Emerson. The Trinity made way for the Triton in 1999, yet another popular product. This workstation became a studio standard for a time with hip-hop, rap, garage and pop producers and the Neptunes and Timberland in particular rinsed the Triton in numerous hits in the early noughties. The late 90s would see the launch of Korg's take on the Groovebox concept with their Electribe series. Initially comprising the EA1 and ER1, this series would go on to spawn numerous generations over the next two decades. Done with the 20th century, there's one more range to discuss. This began with the Chaos Pad, which was a touchscreen device that allowed the user to manipulate audio and apply effects on the fly. The immediacy of this concept again proved popular, and it was used famously by Radiohead in live performances, as well as Brian Eno and Beardy Man. Matt Bellamy of Muse even went as far as to have Chaos Pads installed in his guitars. So Korg evolved the idea into the Chaos Mixer aimed primarily at DJs so that they had these tools at their fingertips. They then introduced the Chaos Oscillator that could produce its own synth sounds that could be manipulated via the touchscreen. Over 20 years after the initial releases, successors have followed and new Chaos products are still in production. <laughs> And to the millennium, and right off the bat came the appropriately named MS-2000, the first new synth to use the moniker in over 20 years. The intention was to bring the flavour and functionality of the original MS range, but with it all amalgamated into one instrument. This was possible because this was not an analogue synthesizer like any of the original MS units. Instead, this was a virtual analogue or VA synthesizer. As well as classic subtractive style synthesis, there was FM synthesis, Korg's 80s digital waves, a vocoder, arpeggiator, mod sequencer, effects, and much more.
Now, one of Korg's collaborators was Stephen Kay, who'd created sounds and demos for numerous products in the 90s. Now, Stephen is a man of many talents, and he wanted to solve the issue that synthesized sounds of acoustic and electric instruments just weren't very convincing at the time. He set out to capture the way those instruments were played so that this could be translated better to the keyboard of a synthesizer. Spending years developing algorithms, the outcome was Kay's Algorithmic Real-Time Music Architecture, or Karma for short, and this debuted in the also named Karma Workstation in 2001. What was innovative here was that a keyboard player could choose an instrument and play a chord and Karma would articulate it in a way that truly reflected the instrument the player was emulating, rather than it just being the sound of that instrument played like a piano. There was then real-time control over rhythmic complexity, voicing, harmony, phrase length, and many other parameters. Karma could also be used to create futuristic electronic effects and could be applied to multiple instruments at once. For example, drums, bass, guitar, and keyboard, creating algorithmic backing tracks with humanized randomness that sounded more like actual musicians interacting with each other. Following on from the MS-2000 and continuing Korg's long relationship with compact synthesizers, the Micro Korg was released in 2002. Again, this was a virtual analogue affair with a vocoder, arpeggiator and effects. But this particular instrument and its price point hit the sweet spot. According to some sources, it's the highest selling synthesizer of all time, shifting hundreds of thousands of units, which explains why it's still in production 20 years later. Tame Impala, Trent Reznor, Calvin Harris, Chromio, Al City, Pharrell, Jay Diller, Kings of Leon, Linkin Park, Warren Ellis, Sebastian Tellier, the list goes on and on and on. This thing is almost omnipresent. Not bad considering this was now three decades into Korg's affair with synthesizers. Now, a product that was initially attempted in the 90s finally saw the light of day in 2005. The Open Architecture Synthesis Studio, or OASIS, was too ambitious when it was first attempted, and whilst a prototype appeared in 1995, basically the usable technology was ploughed into the Prophecy and Z1. A PCI card version of the OASIS did, however, appear in 1999, and whilst it was incredibly powerful for the time, it was a relative flop. By 2005, the technology was finally capable enough for Korg to bring out a suitable workstation that fit the name. And with the latest Karma 2 technology now in their arsenal, the Oasis offered a multitude of different engines called multiple modeling technology. And the ability to install new engines, updates and effects algorithms, something we completely take for granted nowadays. This all added up to make a truly professional instrument, perhaps slightly too professional with its $8,000 price tag, but they did still shift several thousand units. The related M3 in 2007 also made use of Karma, as did their later flagship Kronos, and Korg would continue exploiting their now substantial digital technology with synths such as the Radius. Now, back in the 90s, Korg had marketed a series of guitar pedals and effects called Toneworks, with Korg, of course, having a long history with such technology. Whilst there were numerous units prior to the millennium, it was in 2007 that they were to put out a dozen of them covering acoustic, electric and bass guitars. 
The 2000s would also see a move towards digital recreations of classic products. The Legacy Collection included a software recreation of the MS-20, but with a hardware controller, the MS-20 IC. Despite the fact that the IC makes no sound of its own, cleverly, the patch panel still works for rerouting the virtual audio and control signals in the software. There was even a related product created for the Nintendo DS, the Korg DS-10. Into the 2010s, there were dozens of products from flagship workstations, groove boxes, chaos products, digital recorders, tuners, effects, and much more. But probably the most significant change in the 10s was the reintroduction of analog gear for the first time in decades. This ties in with the employment of chief engineer Tatsuya Takahashi, who had quite boldly approached Korg and asked him for a job. And much like he had been with Tadashi Osanai and Fumio Mieda in the 1960s, Kato and his son Seiki, who was now the president, were willing to take the chance. The first fruits were the Monotron and the Monotribe ribbon synthesizers that featured a modern recreation of the original MS-20 filter. Super simple, lightweight, affordable and accessible, these units were a success, setting the scene for what was to come. Firstly, the Volca series, initially comprising the beats, bass and keys, and later joined by the kick, modular, new bass and mix, and the digital siblings, the drum, sample, and FM. These units can be strung together however you please, and despite their diminutive size, they pack a punch. Now something worth mentioning at this point is that Korg teamed up with Krypton Future Media and released the Miku Stomp in 2014. Now there's a bit of history here because Korg, then KO, put out a fuzzwar pedal called the Synthesizer Traveller F1 in 1973 and this pedal became known as the Singing Geisha. Forty years later, the potential for a singing pedal was on another level entirely. The Miku Stomp uses a Vocaloid software voice bank created for a fictional character called Hatsuna Miku. This voice can be controlled from your guitar. We'll file that one under... why not? In 2015 came the analog reintroduction of the MS-20 in mini and kit formats, along with a rebooted sequencer, the SQ-1. But for the first time, Korg would bring back a vintage synthesizer from another manufacturer, ARP. In collaboration with original founding member David Friend, the classic Odyssey returned in mini, desktop and then full size. But whilst bringing back the classics is fun, Korg wanted to keep making new instruments too, and so followed the Minilog, the Monolog, and the Prolog. And so, to now, the 2020s. As Cork approaches its 60th birthday, there's no sign of letting up, and the many parts of their legacy have representation amongst their modern offerings. From M1 to Nautilus, 
Wave Station to Wave State, DW6000 to Mod Wave, Chaos Oscillator to iChaos Oscillator, WT10 to Pitch Black, and on and on. Each product tells one of the many stories which collectively mean Korg. Fumio Mieda remains involved with the company and recently oversaw a limited reissue of his first synthesizer. The cartoon name remains at the helm through Seiki, who is currently the president, but sadly, Sutomo left us in 2011. In his 84 years, he'd overseen a quite incredible array of achievements that were built from absolutely nothing, and his willingness to take chances and put his trust in the talents of others led to the Korg name becoming a standard in studios and on stages around the world.